In technology today, it's tempting to believe that what's important are the intangibles. The signals bouncing between satellites, the circuit boards with their electrons whizzing round. But at Apple, one of the lessons that Steve Jobs preached fanatically was that physical design is crucial. The form and beauty of your products matters as much, if not more, when you're trying to convince your customers to adopt new concepts and ideas. Now, we all know what bad design looks like. It can be, well, a little bit ugly or impractical, even unsellable. But good design can push the boundaries of what is possible. In 2007, when Apple was designing the first iteration of its iPhone, it spent an estimated 20% more time than its rivals on concept work, taking industrial design to a whole new level. Today, the biggest tech companies are all vying for more design talent. Collectively, Amazon, Google and Facebook have enlarged their art and design departments by 65% in the last year alone, and are hoping to expand further. Typically, UK companies spend six times more on research and development than design, but Phil Third recognised that the look and feel of products is critical to cracking new markets, and you can tell why. The slice of their sales, which comes from innovative new products, is boosted by design from a fifth to a third. So it's no wonder that fully 70% of British companies say they're planning substantially to increase investment. Given the benefits, it's no surprise that one of Britain's most celebrated technology companies has a relentless focus on design. I'm here at the UK headquarters of Dyson, and as you can see, the site is littered with design classics. But we're not in Oxford or Cambridge or London, but in the Cotswolds market town of Malmesbury. Now, it was founded when Sir James Dyson famously grew frustrated with the feeble power of the traditional vacuum cleaner that he was using. More than five years and 5,000 prototypes later, he was ready to unveil his bagless cyclone technology, and the company was founded in 1987. Now Dyson has more than 12,000 employees around the world and annual profits of more than 630 million pounds. But the company also has its sights set on robotics and intriguingly, electric vehicles. So does that make Sir James Dyson Britain's answer to Tesla's Elon Musk? And more than that, will his appetite for risk and new ventures sink the company that bears his name or transform it into a global giant? 30 years ago, you founded a company to make better vacuum cleaners. Dyson is now a global tech company that wants to rival Tesla or Apple, even. Well, I wouldn't put it like that. Uh, I mean, I, I started off doing classics and then went to uh, design school and discovered design and then discovered engineering. So I come at engineering from a design point of view. So I'm interested in the whole product and the, what technology can do to a new product. So that's, and the performance of a product. That's where I come from. So what, what I want to do is develop new technology and make great products that perform really well and are lovely to use. We now at Dyson have more software and electronics people than we do with hardware engineers, which is slightly, I think, slightly sad in a way, because I'm slightly nostalgic for, for things you can actually see and touch. But, but, you know, it's right. I mean, our products must do more and more on their own, anticipate more, and require less interference from the user. And for us, and for me, it's all about the technology and developing products. That's really what it's about. Mm -hmm. I'm not a businessman. And we, everyone we says you are a very clever well, businessman. I don't care what everyone else says. I'm not a particularly good businessman. I just hope that I make good products mm -hmm. that work well and that have better performance than other people's products and that, and that we're out first with things. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. I, for me, the rest follows. How do you look down there and say, this is going to be big, that might not well, be we, we, we may We make them part of our expertise. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, the hairdryer mm. uh, has, has, a, has a motor in it that's faster than anyone else makes a motor. This goes 130,000 RPM. I mean, no one, no one else made motors that went faster than about 30,000 RPM. I mean, people are starting to try and copy this sort of thing. Yeah. But, but, you know, we pioneered that. And that's enabled us to make our... our um, very efficient handheld vacuum cleaners. You know, you wouldn't imagine that a vacuum cleaner like this could be as powerful as a big mains vacuum cleaner. Mm. And that's because we developed the digital motor. Yeah, that, that's a conventional vacuum cleaner motor. We make a motor like that, mm -hmm. and we can put it in a 
little vacuum cleaner, and it's as powerful as a big vacuum cleaner. So that, so that's how that's how technology drives the products we make that are very different to other people's products. Someone told me that in original consumer surveys, they didn't like the idea of a transparent gunge container for the vacuum cleaners, but you went and did it anyway. Is that reflective of a slightly iconoclastic attitude in Dyson and with Sir James Dyson? Well, you, you can go and ask people what they want and go and show them a new product. And they may react well, which is very nice. They may not always react so well. But nevertheless, in spite of that, it might be a successful product. And the, it, being able to see the dirt was considered disgusting by the retailers we showed it to, and indeed by the general public when we showed it to them. But seeing the dirt is honest. You know, this thing is there to pick up dirt. So actually seeing the results of your 20 minutes of sweating, whatever it is, is very nice to see that you pull that out of your home. That's not going to affect you any longer. So uh, sort of on, not worrying about what people's reaction to things is. Is, is and ignoring market research is quite important. It would be nice to do something which they hadn't anticipated. A bit of a surprise. It's always nice. What was the biggest third lap that you found in business? When did you hit the wall? Ah, well, it happens all the time because when you're developing new technology, you know, probably other people have tried the same thing and they haven't succeeded. And they haven't succeeded because at the, when they saw it wasn't working, they probably gave up. So I always think the moment you come up against a brick wall after three years and 5,000 prototypes, that's the moment you shouldn't give up. That's the very moment when you, you redouble your efforts to break through. You know, I built 5,127 prototypes of this cyclonic system before I got it to work. And it sounds like a really tedious thing to be doing, but I was learning all the time. Uh, and, you know, the highs and lows, moments of great depression, moments of elation, thinking I got there, but I hadn't. And then the 5,127th, it worked. Are you an optimist about technology? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, as a force for good. Yes, yes, no, I am, yes. Yeah, I think uh, particularly artificial intelligence in um, making it unnecessary to interact with products. Thank you so much. James Dyson has somehow managed to make the humble vacuum cleaner sexy and reaped huge rewards as a result. Talking to him, it's clear how much he relishes physical engineering, the way minute parts fit together to deliver enhanced performance. For him, design is not about covering up that engineering, but like the transparent gunge containers on his vacuums, revealing it. Now he plans to turn his sights on the automobile industry, an area where looks have always been critical. It just goes to show that even in the age of the algorithm, beauty and innovation still go hand in hand.